Hi, everyone. Thank you for joining OTC Markets and DA Davidson today for our webinar about perception is reality and where you trade matters. Before we get started today, I'd like to go over a couple housekeeping matters. There is a Q&A box on the bottom of the screen. Feel free to type any questions in there and we'll be able to get to them during or at the end of the presentation today. This presentation will also be recorded and available for replay following uh, the conclusion of this webinar. So we will get started now. So by way of introduction, for those of you that don't know me, my name's Laura Hamilton. I manage our banking group at OTC Markets here in New York City, and I'm joined today by Mike Akinpora with DA Davidson. Thank you, Laura. So for those of you that are not aware of who OTC Markets is or what we do, we're a trading market, we're a stock market, where we have 12, over 12,000 securities trade on three of our premium or three of our tiered markets. Companies like BMP Paribas, Adidas, and Roche Pharmaceuticals all trade here from an international standpoint. And from a domestic standpoint, we have 110 community banks that trade on our OTCQX marketplace. OTCQX is our top tier premium market. It's an SEC established public market and no penny stocks are allowed to trade here. It's the closest market you can trade on to the exchanges without being required to be SEC reporting for a bank if you're under 1200 shareholders of record. OTCQB is our middle tier and that's very much a venture marketplace. This consists primarily of pre-revenue healthcare and technology companies. And then pink is an open marketplace and is our bottom tier. Many penny stocks do trade on this market as well as distressed and bankrupt companies. So the reason we're hosting this webinar today is that there's a lot of misconceptions around the banking sector, the current macroeconomic viewpoint and, and where banks trade. The first one is that Many people and bankers think you need to be on an exchange like NASDAQ or the New York Stock Exchange to be successful. This is inaccurate. The Russell Index was rebalanced last week and that was at 160 million market cap. Last year, that threshold was a 250 million market cap. This is where index funds can come in and buy the stock. A number of banks will teeter in and out of the Russell Index uh, varying by year and the volatility. And when, when if you drop out of it, typically banks will see a decrease of roughly 30% of their stock price just from exiting. Of this list of 3,000 companies that are in this indice, there is a weighting based on the market cap size here. Um, additionally, being there used to be a perception that being on the pink market or the expert market, which is even below pink and only registered broker dealers can trade the stock, a retail investor like myself would not be able to buy it. I'd have to call somebody like Mike to be able to trade if you're on expert. This used to be okay. In 2021, there was an SEC rule change called Rule 15C211 that introduced new compliance requirements into the markets in terms of disclosure that was required. Since that change, there have been a number of issues depositing pink stocks into IRA accounts based on further restrictions placed on the pink marketplace. This is done by individual broker dealers and institutional investors, family offices. They can each put their own compliance requirements around buying, trading, and clearing any of these securities. And Mike, feel free to interrupt me from a broker dealer standpoint on any of these items. Um, um, go ahead. I'm sorry. Uh, yes, um, as market makers, we are continuing to see an increased number of brokers um, because of the regulatory concerns and rising compliance costs uh, that are just deciding not to not to allow customers or not to allow not to facilitate trading in um, OTC pink market bank stocks. And unfortunately, that is opening up um, uh, more volume and more trading uh, volumes for uh, electronic trading networks, which we'll, we'll talk about briefly later. Thanks, Mike. Additionally, many people think that you must be SEC reporting to access the US markets. That's inaccurate. As I mentioned, the Jobs Act of 2012 
puts a threshold of 1,200 shareholders of record, which means if you have 100 accounts sitting at Morgan Stanley, that actually only counts as one shareholder of record. Um, so it's a long runway until banks are required to be SEC reporting. And that means that you can save a lot of time and expense by using your bank financials to have a compliant market with um, disclosures out there uh, uh, of the financials of the institution. So again, SEC reporting does not mean you have to, to be public is not required. And just because you are public, it, you think that any investor can buy those shares. That's not necessarily the case. Again, the pink market and the expert market are, have become much more difficult to access from an investor standpoint to where it does create um, a limitation with potential volumes. Mike, anything else to add on this slide? No, that's that's that summarizes it perfectly. Thanks. So many of you are aware of everything that has happened thus far in 2023. We've seen a banking crisis with a number of bank failures. This obviously includes Signature Valley Bank, First Republic Bank, and Signature Bank, all closed down for various reasons and their assets being sold to other institutions. With this being said, they've all, all these securities have now dropped to the pink marketplace, if you were not aware of that. And they are now bankrupt companies. They, their ticker symbols have a Q after them. And they're traded alongside many of the banks that are on this call today. This is creating a number of questions and fury in the investor community. Um, over the last three months, the amount of calls I've gotten about banks trading on pink and the concern and why they're trading there, asking me those questions, when really it's, it, it should be turned around to the bank about why they're traded on this marketplace, because the perception is really becoming uh, more relevant to the institutional uh, marketplace. And it's all about investor protection <clears throat> and thinking about the safety and sound the soundness of your financial institution. There's a big difference between regional banks and community banks. Um, a community bank that might have 800 million in assets should not be compared to a Signature Valley or um, Signature Valley Bank that had over 200 million in assets. These are two different ball games, and everybody is being bucketed together. I mean, even looking at the news this week, PacWest sold their loan portfolio to Aries um, Management. So. Again, all the banks are being grouped together from a negative connotation place in the market. And now is really the time for banks to be out telling their story, not staying under the radar. Why are you different from these failed institutions? Why is your balance sheet more secure than these? What are your risks that you're taking? And what are the risks you are not taking, again, to protect your shareholders as well as the assets that you have? And it goes back to the investor for protection. Um, and, and again, the perception overall, Mike, some points to add. Uh, yes. As, you know, we, we trade all the OTC listed community banks and all the pink traded community banks. And since March, um, our, the shareholders of these community banks and many of my clients who are shareholders of the community banks, uh, have been calling up, um, with, with concern about How's the bank doing? Uh, is this affecting our bank? You know, all they're hearing on CNBC and all of you on this call have heard is bank panic, bank crisis, uh, large, bigger is better. So um, the short the short and sweet takeaway from that is that many times we get calls from financial advisors who are, whose, whose client, the client, you know, the bank stock clients have deposited their shares with these financial advisors and they're calling me up saying, you know, you're the market maker in the stock. I have a client who's thinking of who's, who's looking to sell, you know, two or 3000 shares. And I, and I, a lot, many times I'll say to them, well, you know, why, why does your client want to sell it? And the financial advisor would say, well, aren't bank stocks in trouble? Aren't that, aren't they, you know, all the, aren't the small banks uh, all struggling right now? Don't they have significant headwinds? And my comment to them is, well, have you looked at the quarterly reports for these companies at all lately before you, before you advise your client what to do. And many times I'll send them the quarterly reports and I don't hear from them again. So and, and to that point, is, Mike, Mike, sorry to interrupt you, but to that point well, okay. for a pink bank, some of those quarterly reports are not available. 
Some pink banks do not issue quarterly reports. All that's out there is a call report and there's no chance to issue your qualitative um, commentary around everything that's happened in the past quarter for, for the, your bank. So it is important to have those disclosures from a quantitative and qualitative viewpoint. Exactly. The more information you can give them, especially since most of the community banks didn't blink when that was happening, the more information that you can provide us, your market maker, to help tell your story to the misconception of the general general, you know, uh, general generalists out there, the financial advisors who are managing money for a fee, um, the greater you can help us. And, and I think the, the, the more impact that you'll have on the, the uh, liquidity and the share price of your stock. Absolutely. I mean, community banks are the backbone of America. And with that, it, I've seen too many banks really want to hide right now instead of be in front of telling their story. There's an opportunity to capture market share with um, people changing banks and moving accounts, moving deposits, um, which has slowed in, in the past couple, like two months or so. But with that, again, it, there's a huge opportunity to tell who you are, what are your core values, and, and why you should bank with your bank. Mike and I see this entire marketplace from a 30,000 foot view. So we don't see the day to day, but we're able to connect the dots from the industry standards and trends, uh, which is why we're trying to help banks. Um, and, we're, and we're here to be a resource to you as these questions come up. So then moving on to the next slide, Mike, I'd like to ask you a couple of questions. So as we mentioned, there are three different tiers here at OTC Markets, Pink, OTCQB, and OTCQX. Majority of banks that are on Pink do end up upgrading to QX. What do you see as the biggest differences between the markets? Well, the, diff the biggest differences that I can see that affect me individually when I'm dealing in or interfacing with my investor groups or the, the investors for individual banks is there's a, there's a, there's a huge difference in, in allowing of the broker dealers allowing us uh, who who you know who just trade bank stocks all day long that's all we do for a living is trade OTC and pink banks uh, in the tiers um, the pink banks carry a, a little bit more difficulty in 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 soliciting and unsoliciting well there's a there's a huge difference in soliciting unsoliciting um, clients to buy pink traded stock from OTCQX um, the shareholder trading experience in the QX is, is, is much more transparent. The, the transparency in the QX, uh, in my opinion, uh, creates a much greater level of liquidity, but also a much greater level of comfort for the shareholder who many times their interaction with the bank is, you know, on a quarterly basis. Uh, so any, you know, like I, like I've said before, the, um, any, any, any tools that you could give us as your market maker to help tell your story, but more importantly, to, to um, increase the visibility and liquidity of your shares. And that may be accessing the website of the company with the most recent uh, reports on there, accessing the OTC IQ uh, portal to, to pull the uh, results of your bank off that we can, that, that we can provide to shareholders is, is, uh, is of tremendous importance. Um, you know, uh, the other thing is the trading spreads between the bid and ask as you move up to the QX. A lot of times because you're facilitating liquidity and visibility, a greater liquidity and visibility, and also facilitating the ability of other broker dealers to trade your shares, uh, many times the bid and ask uh, price on those stocks will, will um, be reduced. Uh, Laura, you may have My, some information on that. Absolutely. We do see tighter bid ask spreads when on the QX market compared to pink. We also see more market makers enter the box when uh, on the higher tiered marketplaces. Uh, brokers are actually incentivized to trade higher tiers. There's, there's no fee for brokers um, when they trade from our end for trading the higher tier securities. They do pay to quote pink securities. But Mike, I, I have a question for you. A number of banks are closely held that we work with. In terms of helping to increase that liquidity, what kind of advice do you have from them to help 
help drive these tighter bid ask spreads as well outside of um, the market tier. I think that boils down to the market maker, Laura. You know, you and I were the first ones to list a QX bank many years back, uh, First Atlantic Bank. Uh, I've dedicated my whole practice to working with community banks and their shareholders. It comes down to who your market maker is. I mean, uh, a lot of a lot of a lot of the generalists out there have uh, have have decided that it's it's that the business that they're in is more based on fee based and financial financial consulting. Um, you should make sure uh, the people on this call make sure that you choose a market maker or work, choose to work with the market maker if you're going to move to the QX, uh, who's going to work closely with you and your shareholders and provide a, a much a, a value for your shareholders and and, and a uh, and a source of of um, of communication for your shareholders that will hopefully uh, create. Shareholders more aligned with the company, shareholders who understand investing in bank stocks, but shareholders who are also going to have an expert who trades these banks, working with them uh, to provide the greatest value and the greatest um, long term uh, shareholder uh, commitment to your bank. And, and as and to piggyback off of that, I think that's a great commentary. Thank you, Mike is that as CEOs and CFOs of your financial institutions, you have, you're required to create shareholder value. It's one of the top goals here is, is looking at the stock price. What can you do for investor protection? How do you reduce risk? I think compliance is always a top um, topic when, when speaking to the C-suite or the board. And it's always about, well, how do we mitigate this risk? And trading on the pink market is incredibly risky and doesn't go hand in hand with a number of the values that bankers have. Um, so again, the market has shifted and it's not what it used to be 10 years ago. And even when a number of these banks got traded uh, that are sitting on pink, there were two options at that point. There was the pink market or there was NASDAQ. OTCQX was only created in 2014, for those of you that aren't aware, as really this middle ground to, again, have high financial standards without the cost or complexity of being required to be SEC reporting, um, but are able to help achieve and see a number of that liquidity, have that shareholder um, protection um, and, and move forward with running the bank and telling your story and, and having right. good, strong corporate governance. That, that's a great point. I mean, when we first started back in 2014, 2015, listing listing banks on the over-the-counter markets, uh, the strategy was to list banks on the pink market as kind of a stepping stone to the QX. Uh, but given now with the blue sky exemptions that the QX gives and the and the greater liquidity, but more importantly, the greater uh, uh, ability that I have from a compliance standpoint to work with your shareholders, uh, I now no longer recommend banks start on the pinks and they go directly to the QX. Of course, we have DA Davidson and the community bank group at DA Davidson that I'm, that I'm uh, part of. Uh, we have a checklist that will help the banks that are gonna list, uplist from pink to QX. Uh, we have certain select steps and best practices that we'll work with you on. Um, and so I hope that if you do decide to uplist, and I strongly recommend you do just from a from a compliance standpoint from where I sit, because I do want to be active in your stock. And we are a market maker in your stock now, by the way, um, that you'll uh, that you'll engage with me and engage with us and, uh, and allow us to kind of walk with you and, and talk with your board about some of the best practices that you can that, that we have applied for successful QX trading. Thanks, Mike. We actually have a question that I'm going to pause to answer right now. The question is, are there additional reporting requirements to trade on OTCQX? So it's very, very basic. We require quarterly disclosures in the form of a balance sheet and income statement. Ideally, there will be a quarterly press release within 45 days of quarter end. After year end, we do require audited annual financials by a PCAOB registered auditor that does not mean it has to be done in a PCOB audit. It has to be done within US GAAP, but by a PCOB auditor. So not to confuse anyone there. 
um, and filed with us within 90 days of year end. Additionally, we require the proxy form to be filed and posted to our website two weeks before the annual shareholder meeting. And speaking of annual shareholder meetings, I know Mike has attended a ton of them, again, with helping to your shareholders understand how the stock trades. Um, OTC is a broker-driven market versus the exchanges, which are an electronic matching engine, which again, gives time to react to any trades that come in and is a benefit to trading here um, um, for the financial institution. So it, those are some of the reporting requirements to trade here. It's very, very simple. There are no compensation requirements. There's nothing related to ESG in terms of disclosure. We, we want the bank to focus on running your business and growing in your markets versus focusing on um, full-blown SEC reporting, for example. And Lauren, the, you know, the basic, the basic quarterly reporting can be set up on a template where they just add, you know, the, 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 the language could be the same. You just put the numbers in. Each Absolutely. Quarter. And we always have examples. If there's other questions, feel free to reach out to us and we're happy to point you in the right direction there. So Mike, going back to some of the, the questions on the slide, talk to me about solicited versus unsolicited orders. It's a nightmare for broker dealers, and it's a reason why many of them are, are deciding not to uh, allow their their um, representatives to deal in pink, pink traded banks. It goes to, to blue sky rules. So basically, if I'm if I have a bank in, in Florida uh, and I'm in Florida and I call up a client and say, man, this, I, I think this bank is a great buy, or I call up one of your shareholders and I say, I think this bank is a great buy. If the, if the bank is not blue skied in Florida and, I'm, and I solicited that order because we're under strict FINRA and SEC regulations to mark every order that we have solicited or unsolicited. And believe me, those are looked at very closely by compliance every day. So if I solicit that order and it's not blue skied in that state, uh, that's a violation and the, the, the firm has to send a letter of rescission to the client, giving them one year to put the stock back to us at the cost that they bought it. So that is also an audit item when we are audited by the regulators. So easy to say, most, most, of, the, most, of, the, um, most of the broker dealers aren't even gonna allow their clients or their, or their registered uh, um, securities people to even accept that type of security uh, into the account, and that's not even going into the the you know the this the um, uh, the risk tolerances that the clients have set up with those broker dealers. Exactly, and, and we just we push forward to a slide, and we can go back to afterwards. But OTCQX allows forty states for automatic exemption uh, for the bank. So on the right hand side of this screen, you see an example of a pink bank. There are certain states that because you're a bank will give you an automatic exemption, Louisiana, Illinois, New York, for example. Um, but if you look at the left-hand side, you see the map filled in and that's a QX bank. And this becomes down to compliance. And as Mike said, in terms of recommending and soliciting the stock for orders. The other big piece with blue sky compliance is that research and, and, and a number of our QX banks have gotten large enough and or have had enough coverage, again, it really depends on your marketing and IR plan there with the perception you want from the marketplace um, in terms of getting full-blown research coverage. Research coverage cannot be distributed unless you're blue-skied in that state. So therefore, it limits the people that can learn about the bank. Mike, any other thoughts on blue sky? Otherwise, we'll flip back to to the other side uh, slide real quickly in terms to talk about risk a little further. Very important, probably not uh, not something that's very visual from the bank side, from the CEO, CFO, board, shareholder experience, but very important from the broker dealer side of the equation as far as facilitating order flow. Right. Mike, what kind of advice do you have for banks in the current environment? And talk to me more about some risk mitigation tools. Um, I'm a big proponent of getting back to the community bank model. Um, I've been working and talking with a number of community banks that are that that are starting to reach out into the community and into the um, uh, the customer base. Uh, many banks have grown 
increased considerably in, over the last three years with PPP, et cetera. Many of them have new clients. Uh, in my in my humble opinion, bear markets are a great time to to uh, reach out to your customers and uh, bring bring in some newer shareholders. At this point, um, many times banks get uh, get um, caught up in the, the regulatory side or the growing side or the, the execution of the business plan side and the constant, the, the, the day to day blocking and tackling of identifying new investors kind of gets put to the sideline. So these are these are market resets that I think are fantastic opportunities, not only from a value proposition, but also from a, an opportunity for you to tell your story. So uh, that is something that I've been advising many banks to do and a lot of them are taking heed and starting to put together some programs to to reach back into the community um, and reach back into their customers who are not shareholders but also to their shareholders also uh, Great. the other thing too is there's a you know there's a misconception out there uh, there's a misconception among the overall the generalists out there that are financial planners that banks are a bad place to be uh, we're all bank stock investors most of us on this call these are great places to be. Bear markets are what are the best time for you to go out and promote your shares to new individual and to current shareholders, or the best time for you to engage a broker such as myself, who understands the bank stock market 38 years uh, that can that can explain bank stock investing to your current shareholders or your prospects, and then be able to execute the order for the customer in a way that the we we give a the best execution we can uh, in some of these uh, banks that have widespread. Appreciate that. And we stay on top of them too. We, we stay in constant contact with those shareholders. I, I would challenge the bankers on this call to think about having a plan. Everyone always wants to time the market. When are we going to come back? When's it going to be down? When do we do a buyback? When do we promote our shares? But if you have a plan and think about this more regularly, I've had so many banks that have said, all right, we want to do something. We want to do something. Five years have passed and they've done nothing. So what's the missed opportunity cost of doing absolutely nothing and just kicking the can down the road for something that is it's a lot of small pieces that add up to, again, risk mitigation, better compliance, better visibility. If you want to be visible, just because you take a higher step with compliance doesn't mean you have to increase your investor relations activities. So it, Quarterly financials are just, just as important for retail investors as it is for institutional. But if you don't want to go to a conference, that, that's okay. You don't have to. Um, we also get a lot of questions around activist investors due to more exposure. It is so rare to see an activist investor come in. There's typically just not enough shares available for purchase to even take any majority position. Um, and something to also note, just in the interest of time, We've actually had four banks voluntarily delist and deregister from NASDAQ in the past year. And I'm having a number of conversations with others. Um, due to the current market environment, there it's becoming a better understanding that QX is a good place to trade. Um, banks that do not fit into the Russell index, they, they're spending a lot of time and a lot of money, like around $500,000 annually to be traded there when it, it's and not to knock the exchanges. They're good for the right companies, but companies should ultimately have the choice of where they want to trade and let the market be able to, to help with, with the, their specific goals. So I think, again, just in the interest of time, moving forward to two slides, please. And Mike, feel free to interrupt with anything. A lot of people also ask the question, well, what's the uplift? What does it look like? Um, it really does vary based on the share structure, the price structure. What is your shareholder base? Uh, you need to have some sellers to have some buyers. You need to work with your, your brokers like Mike to help execute on these orders. Um, but we did a valuation study looking at companies following SEC Rule 15C211 two years ago of that value add. And you can see that there's almost a 24% value creation um, of banks that did uplist to the QX marketplace. Um, so that, that is just a point to note. And then going on to the next slide, another data point, because everyone loves data, um, looking at the OTC QX banks index, this is um, a benchmark index um, versus a buy-in currently, but 
we, we marked it and tracked it against the ABA bank index from March, 2023. If you look at the QX banks versus the NASDAQ banks comparatively, the QX banks have outperformed that index. Um, and again, shows the security, the compliance around it, the less, uh, uh, some volatility differences, right? In, in those trading in and out of QX bank stocks versus the exchange bank stocks during this banking crisis. So again, perception is really reality. And thinking about that big picture, I challenge you to sit with your management teams, think about how the outside view um, market sees your stock, sees your bank. What are those goals of your institution over the next 12, 24 months? Mike, any commentary? Well, my commentary is more my 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 commentary and my focus is more as on being an efficient market maker. In, in summary, you know, uh, just what we do. The bottom line is we help create a partnership with all the all the custom all the um, OTC traded pink or QX banks on this call. You know, that's the goal. You know, the goal is to help it create liquidity. The goal is to help manage volatility uh, and we do that because we commit capital and i could go through you know yesterday was a perfect example we bought a huge amount of stock of a bank that was an institution was pushing the share price down so we went in and with the bank bought um, the largest volume trading day of ever uh the stock's up about 10 percent, you know five percent now today but uh got shareholders in at the right price um we want to you know we facilitate market intelligence and more importantly, we make sure that we execute and also educate your shareholders about the special, the special um, uh, position that your shareholders are in by owning your bank. You know the value proposition of your bank. Community banks are extremely important, but also the investor experience of being a community bank is somewhat unique, um, and we're we're very sensitive to making sure that they get best advice and execution that they can get as your trade, you know, as our, as a value trading partner, DA Davidson. And, and also both of us are always happy to answer the phone and answer any questions you may have um, around your trading experience. Um, moving on briefly to some Q&A. There's two questions I have here. And just a reminder, any additional questions, please put them into the box. Um, one of them is bank stocks, uh, prices have been under pre pressure recently. Uh, in your opinion, is this really a good time to move to the OTCQX? Mike, I'm going to give that one to you. I think it's the best time to move to the QX. It's going to, you know, the QX requires a little bit of planning um, just, just to make sure that you, you know, you're, you're set up for your, your, your earnings disclosures. Um, I, I personally think it's a great time to, um, to, to go out to the shareholder base and say, hey, we're, you know, we're, we're moving up to the OTCQX. Um, it's, 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 instead of being defensive, it's offensive, uh, but it's also price-wise and, and value-wise, I think it's a great time to, be, to go on the offensive. You have, we, most of the banks on this call have good stories to tell. Valuations are much more reasonable than they were a year ago. Um, in my humble opinion, and, and I, you know, I, I deal in these bank stocks 24-7, uh, this is a great time to be a buyer of community banks. And last but not least, show, moving up to the QX from the pinks shows that you care about your shareholders, but more importantly, that you're doing something to hopefully increase the value of the bank going forward. And reduce the risk of the stock and the volatility exactly. around it. Um, I, I, I couldn't agree more. I think there's a huge opportunity for community banks to be out there sharing their story right now and being the next big um, player within their markets. Um, on that note, that's more, good. I have, I'm sorry, I have one more point. Just one more. Remember, just remember, uplisting to, from the pink to the QX does not necessarily mean that you're going to attract a different type of investor. You still have the same shareholders, whether you're listed on the pink or the QX. In my humble opinion, staying on the pink sheet and and restricting the, the uh, access to information, it, it's gonna have what I think an, an oversized detrimental effect on your valuation. Valuation is what attracts dissident shareholder groups. They take advantage of dislocations in the market. So 
in, in my opinion, staying listed on the pink sheet or even getting listed to down to the uh, expert market uh, increases the likelihood of a dissident shareholder being attracted to the valuation of your bank or an aggressive shareholder. Let me put it that way, not a dissident. All good points. It's a good segue into the, the next question we have. Uh, if our bank wants to join OTCQX, what does the process look like and how long does it take? What are the costs? So it's very simple because of our already being on the pink market, it's about a six week process. There's an application that's filled out, very simple back and forth with our team and, and choosing a corporate sponsor. This is somebody like Mike and DA Davidson that will help support the stock and make a market in it. Uh, the bank has full control of when they want to join and pick their launch date once our team gets to the end of the process. Um, the cost is very nominal. It's $25,000 annually. That is prorated based on January 1st. So at this point of the year, you're down to twelve five dollars um, for the remainder of the year. There is a one-time $5,000 application fee, um, but otherwise it's a very straightforward process. It's, it's essentially looking at shareholder structure, making sure the disclosures are out there, and working with the management team to, to get um, traded on QX. And the, the blue sky benefits of those 40 states go into effect day one of being traded. Any, any other questions at this time? And Mike, any other commentary? My last commentary is the people on this call, you put so much time, effort, mental equity into the day-to-day -day workload of running a profitable community bank. Provide us your market makers, we who set the market price of your stock and determine your net worth, a good portion of your net worth every day, give us the opportunity to trade your shares in the best market possible. It's, 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 not, it's a very nominal amount, in my opinion, and the benefits so much more outweigh the, the costs. And just remember, we're here to work with you to make sure that you get the most effective, you get your most bang for your buck. Let me just put it that way. And I Absolutely. also want to thank everybody. Thank you. And, and we want to see the banks be successful. We want to give you the tools to help you be on that level that we know a number of you are um, and, and reduce any risks that are associated with it, especially in this market with the failed banks. And as I mentioned a couple of minutes ago, there's a huge opportunity here. I, I challenge you to go and capture it. And thank you again. A friendly reminder, this is available for replay. And please feel free to reach out to Mike or myself with any additional questions. Thanks. Thank you.